Jack's not on. We're having a very secret and personal conversation. It is hugely important as an outcome, but addressing it very rarely is about taking a thing and giving it to the person and saying, here's your nutrition, and, and, um, and that's why for me, I don't know about nutrition growth. I'm just not invested in it. So how was your Friends, friends, colleagues, should we get started? Friends, colleagues, the brave, the deluded, the ones who are still here at 7 a.m. on a Friday morning, the committed, I should say. Can, you, can I ask you to take your seats? Believe in naming and shaming. So good morning, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Lawrence Haddad. I'm the executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Thank you for coming to this session this morning. I know it's difficult to make it so early on, a, on the last day of an event. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our partners for helping us uh, think this through and organize it and participate in it. Uh, we have a wonderful group of partners. and. Uh, most of you are here. In fact, you're the large proportion of the audience. So thank you for being here. I, um, whenever I, whenever I come back from Davos, um, my nine country directors at Gain uh, look at me with not fear but trepidation <laughs> because they say, um, you know, Lawrence, you've come up. You've, you've been exposed to all kind of fancy ideas about food system transformation, um, but we're the ones in the, in the countries that have to make things happen. And uh, things can look fairly straightforward and simple and connected at the stratospheric level of a place like Davos. But when you get down to Nampula in Mozambique, uh, things get really messy and really complicated. So. We thought it might be a, an, in, an interesting and an important thing to do, even though we don't have, I don't think, any government representatives here from Africa or Asia uh, or Latin America. We thought it would be really important to talk a bit and sensitize ourselves about the challenges of these kind of transformations at a national level and to also ask ourselves what can we do to support our national stakeholders, whether they're governments, businesses, uh, donors, civil society, the UN, the people who are actually making 
trying to make things happen at the national level. And the national level is really important. I mean, we do know that a lot of the problems with uh, food systems need to be resolved at a, at a collective level and a global level, but many, many of them have to be resolved at a national level too. We need to make the national transformations uh, irresistible, implementable, and actually make them inevitable. So that's, that's really our challenge. Um, that's what this focus is this morning. We're doing this in the context, however, of the Global Nutrition Summit, uh, which is going to be in middle of December in Tokyo this year. And we're doing it uh, in the context of the summit because while we've been focusing a lot on the World Food Summit, or the World Food System Summit coming up in 2021, the nutrition one is one of the, the big summits on the road to uh, the World Food Systems Summit. It's the, it's the biggest opportunity nutrition has to position itself as a central driver of the SDGs. It's the biggest opportunity really since 2013. So we have to make, a, we have to make sure it really matters and really counts, and we have to make sure it really feeds in to the 2021 summit. So a lot of us in this room have been doing a lot of work to build the commitments around a whole range of things. Um, many of those commitments focused at the national level. And you'll hear about a few of those this morning. You'll also hear about um, the challenges and the opportunities at the national level. So I'm, I'm going to, um, this is how it's going to work this morning. We're a very small group, high quality group, and a, and a very informal group, because we, we know, most of us know each other. Um, so we're going to keep it informal. We're going to have uh, Herda is going to uh, kick us off. Uh, Herda is the, um, uh, the Sun Scaling Up Nutrition Coordinator, a uh, really key figure in the nutrition ecosystem. She's going to, and, and you know, Sun, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, 61 countries, four Indian states. Did I get that right? I'm a member of the Sun Executive Committee, so I take it very seriously. Um, all, all of the key members of Sun are national governments. The businesses are there, of course. The donors are there, of course. Um, the UN is there, of course. But without the governments, you wouldn't have Sun. So Gerda is going to give us a, a perspective on national governments. Then Melissa is going to... I just want to quickly run through it, Herod, and then I'll give it over to you. Melissa is going to then tell us a bit about the fantastic work FOLU is doing. Melissa is the managing director of programs at FOLU. And they've done this brilliant, did I get that right? Ish? Program, it's just a matter of time, <laughs> Melissa. Um, she, uh, and she was instrumental in uh, supporting the team and probably wrote some of it who produced this fantastic report. Can you just wave it around? Thank you. The Growing Better Report. And she's gonna tell us a little bit about, I think, I hope, about how the 10 critical transformations in that report, how do they play out at a national level? It, it, it's, it's great. It was difficult enough to get that to work at a global level. How does that play out at a national level? That'll be your first set. So they'll, they'll be talking, us, telling us about the sort of um, the why. Why is this so important? David's then going to tell us a bit about his food system dialogue. David Nabarro, the curator of the food systems dialogues, amongst other things. Good morning. David's going to tell us a bit about what has he learned coming out of the food systems dialogue at the national level. About three quarters of the, yep. of the 30 FSDs have been national level ones. I've only ever been to a couple of the global ones or three of the global ones, and I'm sure they're very different to the national ones. And I, w I want to know what's happening at the national ones, and I'm sure you do. And then we will talk a bit about how can, we, how can the rest of us support. Come in, come in, come in. OK, don't come in. <laughs> That's good, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Faika. Um, I think that's going to be the new way of, of uh, presenting it, presentations. <laughs> Just stick your head in the door, say. Um, the, uh, then, and then we're going to talk a bit about um, some of the things that we're doing for the nutrition for growth. We're going to talk about financing. We're going to talk a bit about data. And we're going to talk a bit about the uh, Scaling Up Nutrition Network. And then finally, uh, scale the uh, Sun Business Network. And then finally, we're going to hear from um, Vanessa, Adams, where's Vanessa? Yeah. Right, right, 
here. And Vanessa is the VP for country programs and partnerships and something else. And Vanessa is knows knows what it takes to make things happen at the, the national and country level. She's going to give us some reflections, and then finally we're going to have Christian Frutiger, who is the deputy head of the Swiss Development Co uh, Corporation, and he's going to give us some uh, final reflections. So we've got quite a busy time. We have uh, plenty of time for, for discussion, Q&A, general chat, as well as some other presentations. I'm going to spare the presenters from sitting on these chairs. You can if you want. They look super uncomfortable to me. <laughs> I always fall off them whenever I sit on them. But if you can figure out how to sit on them, fine. Otherwise, you can just stand. We are being live streamed today. So uh, don't say anything too embarrassing uh, if you don't want it to be live streamed. We, I think we have a live stream audience of about 40 or 50 at the moment, so that's good. Um, you do have to come and stand in this space if you want to be, to be seen. And before, before, I, um, before I finish, I just have to, I have to read out a statement, because we, we were hoping that the government of Japan would be here today to, to kick us off. Um, but we have a message from, the, from Ambassador Suka, Su Sukada who's the Director General of Global Issues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. And I just want to read out a few excerpts, and, and, and this is on your tables. Um, I'm sending you this message as it was not possible for me to join this meeting. As you know, Prime Minister Abe announced that Japan will host the Nutrition for Growth Summit in 2020 to promote efforts in the field of nutrition. The f this forms part of Japan's, Japan's commitments to strengthen global momentum towards universal health coverage. The goals of the summit are to position nutrition as the essential driver of sustainable development and to secure new and refreshed policy and financial commitments for the next decade from governments, civil society, private sector, donors, the UN, and businesses. And, and Diane Holdoff will, will tell us about uh, what, what, what um, the World Business Council for, uh, for Sustainable Development and a, a group of other organizations are doing to that, uh, to that end. Um, the Ministry welcomes this session at Davos examining how to support national actions around nutrition. National focus is the key to change. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. No, Gerda, sorry. Sorry, it's Friday. Gerda. Thank you, Lawrence. Good morning, heroes. Fourth morning here in um, Davos, and you all look so relaxed and motivated and eager to learn, but even better, to work together. Because my message is quite simple. Please connect and interact at global level and at country level. That's my demand, not only for the nutrition for growth, but let me focus on this, but also for COP26, for thinking about food systems, for thinking about climate and uh, the planet, for thinking about health, communities, and whatever. When it comes to uh, the, the nutrition for growth summit, it's a great opportunity, as Laurence uh, said already. Um, and what I see is five topics well prepared, thank you all for um, investing in it, but they are siloed. In my view, if you read the report and if my people at country level read the report, they say, all right, universal health care coverage need to deal with itself, uh, food systems need to deal, and we need, of course, to pay attention to accountability, etc. The uh, challenge at global level right now is for all the players to see where they can work together. Let me give one example, not from the food systems, but from universal health coverage. There is no attention, no attention for preventing malnutrition when children are born, for, uh, uh, for uh, support for uh, women who are giving birth, or even better to start with taking care of nutrition of adolescent girls to promote breastfeeding. And we all know breast is the best to prevent uh, malnutrition that is stunting the body and the brains. So these kind of things let us interact at global level because exactly as Lauren said, situation in the countries is different. So that's my, my second question. Do let us do our homework 
um, and then let's stand next to the people at country level, put ourselves in their shoes and take it from there. Uh, and in order to support them to make an ambitious, but also a uh, realistic agenda and bid for uh, Tokyo. And for that, uh, to do this, let us come together at country level. It is still too fragmented. It will put Africa on the food systems. The Sun Movement is involved. There are many food systems dialogues, great. There is some Folu people in uh, Africa. We have Agra, we have Nepat, we have IFNA. And they all want to do good, but they do all do their own thing. Bring people together. Um, and then build a strong agenda, but be ready to interconnect and to really face the challenges they have. So this is um, my simple request. Um, I have learned a lot this uh, week. I've also heard that many people do not believe in governments, and I can understand it. But we need strong governance, and it cannot be done by a uh, private sector alone. Forget it. It cannot be done by NGOs alone, forget it. Continuing to think that donors can save the world, forget it. So what is needed here? Push for good governance and accountability and put the things that are dear, both people and planet, on the agenda for political campaigns. And then hold these people to uh, account. It can happen, I have seen the uh, examples, and in those examples where people push for change, where people are ready to hold politicians to account, things are changing in the interest of people and the planet alike because they are joined. You cannot save the, people, the planet without investing in people and the other way around as well. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you, um, you, you talk regularly to the 61 focal points, yeah. the national focal points in this uh, sun members. What do they want from a group like this? I mean, what, are, what are they looking for? Um, <coughs> um, we had a global gathering in Kathmandu, where, this, where the people uh, from the countries, delegations, over 1,000 participants said, listen, don't build the agenda for us. We know we need to implement uh, the sustainable development goals. We know that we need to improve the food system. So please bear with us. Um, and support us to bring the, the, the dots together. The most important thing is what they, what they requested is align amongst yourselves, support us in capacity building, get help us to get the data systems right and prevent more data uh, confusion or um, what have you, project of confusion, etc. But please support us in bringing uh, people together and don't think that you have to invent a wheel because there are so many wheels already here that we need to coordinate and work and always keep in mind who is it that we are doing this for. Not for the government, not for uh, uh, companies. We do it to support the people to take their life and the future in their own hands. That's that ask. That's, that's great. So remember who's the boss, yes. right? Remember who's the boss. And leave the egos and the logos out of yes. the picture, please, yeah. at the national level as well as the global. And okay. The Sorry? And the formats. Yeah, and the formats. <laughs> and what? The formats. We tell you how to do it. Oh, I see. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning, David. I'm so glad you put me. Um, before David, thank you, that was kind. Um, anyone who was at the dinner um, over there last night, um, pity Dominic Worry having to follow Al Gore. <laughs> so, um, the FOLU report, I hope you've all read it. I've got a couple of spare copies if you haven't. Um, save me from taking them back to London. Um, you, you know, the, the waterfall chart with the hidden costs, that's the one that people pick up the phone and they. They, they, they love, you know, they like that slide. They, they take the pictures of that. It's a pretty compelling um, uh, exhibit, which is showing the hidden costs of today's food and land use systems, 12 trillion per annum, set to rise. And out of that, you'll see that the biggest wedge of that is from coming from health. So when we present that slides in countries, 
obviously these are, this is a global level aggregate, but you know, it, it opens up a really interesting conversation with people who may not have thought about the kind of the implications of that. I come from the environment and climate world. And so suddenly you're seeing there's an opportunity here for those who are sort of pushing on the climate environment agenda to go to those ministries and say, but look at this as well. You know, if we actually transform food and land use systems, look at all these other benefits that can come from it. So this needs an integrated agenda. And we all know, I, I spent most of my career working in government, the Australian government and the UK government. And we know that actually ministries themselves work in silos. So what FOLO is doing at the country level is we are trying to really create a platform to drive this kind of integrated agenda. So the, the FOLU report, if you like, gives some, gives some examples. Gives, it's a consultation document. That's what we call it on the front. Because now that conversation needs, to, on the 10 critical transitions, needs to now come down to the country level. So in Colombia, China, India, Ethiopia, and I'm forgetting one, where we have these FOLU country programs, they are now developing their own versions of this 10 critical transitions. Colombia and Ethiopia and Indonesia, it's the one I forgot, are the, they were the initial countries that we started with with FOLU. So they already have in place these sort of action agendas. And it creates, it's got to be contextualized because every single country's situation is different. It's unique, it's going to require its own approach. So there's a, a consultation process with multiple stakeholders that then feeds into that country's action agenda. Um, we're doing research and analysis in a lot of these countries as well, because a lot of them are actually really interested. They want to know what do these costs look like for their country, so we can break that down. And that then is the opportunity then to go and talk to finance ministers, planning ministers and others and bring people together and say we need to stop working in these silos. There's an opportunity here to develop policies that deliver against multiple objectives. One of those opportunities that we're looking at right now is around repurposing agricultural subsidies. So you would have seen in the Foley report, we really highlight this as, as, as a, you know, um, um, a huge amount of public money that is in very few cases being going to incentivize public goods. So that is a travesty, but it's also an opportunity. So in um, UNCAS, the Climate Action Summit in September, uh, FOLU and a number of other partners were supporting this uh, initiative called the Just Rural Transition. And we have formed a policy action coalition. And that is really finding governments who are willing to move forward on this issue and saying, we will provide all the support we can give you, technical support, implementation support, to design those policies to repurpose agricultural subsidies and see, can we use that to uh, incentivize uh, farmers to um, not only sort of be you know, stewards of the land and to be rewarded for that, as well as agricultural production, but also can we start to sort of think about this as a way to think about what farmers are producing so that we can also deliver against that critical transition about healthy diets. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So <clears throat> David's doing stuff at the national level. EAP is doing stuff at the national level. WBCSD is, GAIN is, WEF is probably as well. How do we, in, in the consultations you're doing around, in the, in the countries you mentioned, how do we connect up some of the stuff we're all doing at the national level? So Steve and I have got a meeting coming up where we're going to be thinking through particularly that GAIN piece and AGRA and others. So FOLU is made up of a number of core partners, as you know, and in our in our next strategy for the next three years, we really want to do that. We really want to kind of, our biggest priority is actually making things move at the country level. Um, I mean, governments have, you know, in the global south, we're completely fine. They, they don't want to be come at from multiple different angles. So if we can actually just have one meeting where we bring multiple ministries together, and that, sometimes that happens and sometimes 
frankly, they just say that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, so you know we have to again. This is this depends on the country, but certainly our ambition is. What you know, it is really interesting when you get officials from you know the Ministry of Health together with the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Environment. Often, you know, often the fact that we may hold a you know a, a session on FOLU or food systems dialogue, it creates the opportunities to do that. Um, and others, governments are actually starting to put in place those kinds of processes. But we, I think, as those who support these efforts, also need to do more to join up so that we're making it easier for governments to engage us and they can see what's the value of a JRT policy action coalition as well as this TFA, as well as this, you know, FOLU and the Food Action Alliance and all these different things. So we need to be better at communicating what do all these different things um, offer, what kind of expertise, and, and um, show how we ourselves are kind of supporting that integrated agenda in a more efficient way. Um, and I think you, to your point, not competing over, you know, um, over sort of pushing our logos or anything. Um, the other thing, just um, finally just closing out, is that what I'm hearing in countries is they don't know what to do. So particularly, you know, you would have seen the top, uh, the, the FOLU 10 critical transitions, promoting healthy diets. This is, this is the top one. We see this, what people choose to eat, as the most critical thing that can, you know, affect the entire, you know, whether or not we can implement the whole agenda, the reform agenda program. This is the most crucial one. But, you know, governments are saying we don't, we don't really know what to do. So... What we also want to really do with, with the Food and Land Use Coalition work is actually encourage countries to start to share experience and learning with each other, develop those kind of case studies. Um, one of our partners, SDSN, is developing a Food and Land Use Action Tracker, which will look at, you know, for each of these countries, what they're doing. So you've got a database that you can go to. And countries can start to learn from each other because really we're going into uncharted territory. Finally, you know, Coming from the UK government, you know, when I worked in climate change and I would suggest, dare suggest that, you know, maybe we want to sort of take this dietary approach, you know, governments are also, you know, feeling that they, they you know, they don't want to be the nanny state. They don't want to tell consumers or tell, tell their vote, you know, uh, citizens, like, what to eat, what to do. So we still have got quite a lot of work to do there. But I think through multi-stakeholder approaches, through... Um, you know, working at regional level, working in, you know, working with business, you know, we can actually start to shift this and kind of build, build the demand for these kinds of reforms as well. Thank you. Thanks for your, <laughs> thanks for your leadership, thanks for FOLU's leadership and your leadership. And, and I feel like we're all pretty well connected at the global level and the next challenge for us is to be connected at the national level and FOLU's doing a, a great job of, <laughs> of helping us do that. David. T tell us, give us insights from the, the national level food systems dialogues, these wonderful dialogues. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. First of all, one of the most important things about this group is that I think actually we are pretty much fellow travelers over quite a long period. So just to test that, I just wanted to find out, first of all, how many people here were at the Sun Global Gathering in uh, Kathmandu this year, just out of interest? So quite a decent number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many people have participated in at least one of the food systems dialogues? Quite a lot as well. So and in a way, Lawrence, what I, what I would love to do is just to simply have everybody sitting at their tables uh, with people who've been at Food Systems Dialogues at each table and just get people themselves to contemplate what is the usefulness of the Food Systems Dialogues as a participatory process. Because in a way, that's what the whole thing for me has been about, really, ever since we started on the journey, or I started on the journey with the Sun Movement in that long design phase between 2009 and 2010, after a, a kind of sense of a complete meltdown in the nutrition community that you were very much looking at and watching in 2009. Well, no, I'm, I absolutely was just trying to find a way not to slip that in, but you might be feeling a bit guilty. But it, it, was, it was interesting because in 2009, a subject that 
is so massively important for every single one of the human beings on this world became unhinged because of a massive set of battles between people from different disciplines and people indeed working at global level and working at local level. And it was, it was a really difficult phase. And, and I remember being asked by uh, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, almost to sort of go in and try to find some way to resolve a situation that was really deeply embarrassing at the time. Because we all knew from the data that a, an individual whose nutrition is compromised early in life has a, a long-term handicap. It was just coming through from study after study, and particularly the La second Lancet special series on nutrition. And so here we have a, a situation where we see people are, are personally disadvantaged, and yet at the same time, collectively, we couldn't find the way to deal with it. And at the time, I think there was quite a lot of self-beating going on, but gradually we realized that it was kind of inevitable. And that's because the nutritional state of an individual is an outcome of multiple interacting processes in the household, in society, and even globally, that interact in very different ways, in different settings. And so to create a nice, clean, simple, linear pathway for getting nutrition right just didn't seem to work. And I think that reason why I wanted to check a little bit about where we've all come from is I think just about every single person in this room has had to wrestle with the reality that this is a really serious issue that affects every individual in the world. And yet at the same time, it's extraordinarily hard. Even in a local situation like where I used to work when I started doing this in East Nepal, there are really clear, single, linear pathways to sort it out. So let me interrupt you on that. So you're the only one who's been to all the national level yeah. stakeholder uh, quizzes yeah, and silos, right? That. You're going to get that. I'm going to get that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the reason why I'm saying this is that the, we had to try to find a way Gunhild, Peter Backer, Dominic Warre, and then later Jeremy and yourself, to see if it was possible to enable everyone who wanted to to explore for themselves what it took to deal with a complex system challenge. And that's what led to the idea that bringing together people with very different perspectives on the systems might help them to themselves get comfortable with this complexity. And that's what led to the concept of the Food Systems Dialogues. And it was Gunhild who said to me quite early on, you know, that's actually what EAT is all about. And it was Dominic said, yeah, that's what we're doing in the forum. Peter Backer, very clearly, this is what business is trying to get into. And so when we designed the dialogues, they were not meant to be any kind of effort to take a specific activity. They were meant to be giving people, wherever they were, a chance to work through the reality that when you're dealing with the systems issue, you have your own perspective. And you can't expect anybody else to tell you what to do. So in the dialogues in Indonesia, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in Colombia, Ghana, India, we have seen that kind of recognition come forth. And my question to all of you is, is that dialogue format actually helping people to align their thinking and become more unified in their approach to systems work? Or is it confusing them? I don't know the answer. Because that's the whole trouble with systems work, is actually measuring the impact of what you're doing is horrendously difficult. There are evaluators all over the place having conferences about how to do it. There have been meetings of philanthropists here in Davos having discussions about how to work out whether their system support is actually working. But I think what we have in the dialogues is some chance to look at it. And my conclusion 
from the dialogues to date is that it's an incredibly powerful and helpful way for people to come together. Why? Because we've had repeated dialogues in a number of settings, and we've also had the same people participating in different dialogues, and we've been able to follow them and find out what they feel. So in India, the first food systems dialogues at the end of 2018, we had people in rooms like this. They refused to sit together at tables to talk. The people focusing on the state of farmers would not sit at the same place and talk to people from government. People from government and farmers would not talk to people from the private sector. We had people walking out of the room, shouting, not, not being prepared to talk in the same language to each other. A year later, same people, completely different style, completely different outcomes, much more aligned collective action. It was though somehow the period over the year had given them a chance to find the space to respect each other's perspectives and work together. In Ethiopia, I believe we've also seen an interesting shift. The actual dialogues in Ethiopia were intriguing, but we've had continuous contact with the teams in Ethiopia over time that suggests that they've softened some of the tribal disagreements between the health people, the ag people, and the social development people. In Colombia, I sense that because the dialogues came into a really positive environment where we'd already had a lot of work being done, both by um, groups from outside as well as groups from inside Colombia, we had a very useful advance in thinking and action that made it better. So in conclusion, I'd like to suggest to you that when dealing with complex systems issues, it doesn't work simply to tell people, you must think like this and you must work like that. Instead, you have to give them a space in which they can work out what they want to do in their environment and then they will advance it. I want to develop what I call Food Systems Dialogues Mark II, where there's actually support to groups over time so they can align their narratives, develop networks and work out the points where they want to try to nudge systems for themselves so we can actually move from just talking to actually using the dialogues as a way to equip ourselves for systems change. We're not there yet. I've discussed it with some of the sponsoring organisations and it will come. But that's my summary, is that this isn't a bad way for systems work. David, thank you. <coughs> And David's, you know, David, I used to say a lot, um, we need to talk to people that we don't normally talk to. We need to get out of our comfort zone. David said to me, no, Lawrence, we need to talk to people we don't necessarily like. <laughs> we need to talk to people we don't necessarily respect. We need to do whatever it takes to move the needle. So thank you, David. Um, right. Now... Um, business is a big part of this Nutrition for Growth Summit, which is a, actually a big change from 2013. In 2013, in London, businesses were kind of a bit of an afterthought. They kind of came in at the end. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not much. Uh, this year, it's very different. Uh, there's Businesses have been really, uh, certainly in the last six months, really at the center of commitments. We, there's a big recognition in, in our community that Businesses are often a big part of the problem, but they have to be a big part of the solution. So I'm really happy to introduce Diane. Uh, Diane is the, um, I always get your title wrong, the Director of Food and Nature. Yes, Here, close enough, at WBCSD. And um, WBCSD together with Consumer Goods Forum and about four other um, associations, business associations, have come together to really work on developing these commitments. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I have, this is the first time all week I have been in a room at Davos where the energy level has been this low. And I know it's Friday morning, and I get it. It's been a long week, but come on, people. This is really important stuff that we're here to talk about this morning, because we cannot think that we are going to successfully transform the food system for healthy people and planetary boundaries if we're this tired. <laughs> and there's a lot that we have yet to do. A huge part of that is ensuring the success of the Nutrition for Growth Summit. 
in our mind, this is a really critical milestone event to and through the Global Food System Summit, Global Food Summit, because we have to put nutrition at the center of this conversation. And for too long, it has been really a separate silo. And each of us have spoken to that in our own way here this morning. But the fact that we're all still here and we're showing up for each other and for this issue, to me, shows the level of dedication and energy and commitment that we're bringing to making sure that we look at the role of healthy foods, nutrition, in everything that we're doing. Bringing the business voice into this conversation is also kind of an audacious thing. And I am very happy to represent in partnership how business can play a better role in helping to bring solutions into this conversation. And, you know, there's both challenges with that, but tremendous opportunity with that. And so what I'm going to do is something slightly different from the format we've had this morning. We still have something new to share. We've got a launch of a new video here this morning, and I'm gonna turn it over to the video and let the video speak, and then come back in and talk about what that actually means for action and next steps. We can roll the video, please. Together, you know, I think that together is the key message for what it is that we're trying to do. I think this will come back on. Yeah, there we go. So the fact that we're all still here showing up for each other, to me, is the key message to the fact that, yeah, we are committed to doing this together, and we are committed to doing our part. You spoke, Lawrence, about the importance of the business role in contributing to the agenda this year. We're really proud, through Allison Karens, who's here, to together be contrib contributing to the BCG, the business constituency group, and trying to make sure that we're bringing the types of business commitments forward that are going to be the ones that demonstrate that this is real change and the role of business. Un business understands their role in helping to achieve that. That takes a lot of different forms. Of course, it's important to address these issues through product portfolios. And there's a lot of work that we have underway through our positive nutrition work and our plant forward work that companies want to bring forward and share about what's gone into the foods and importantly also what's come out of the foods and how we're looking to diversify those product portfolios to bring more health, more nutrition and planet benefits and climate benefits as well because we know these are connected topics. But equally, there's things and actions that companies are doing within their own supply chains and value chains 
food safety. We don't talk about that enough, but that is the front line of keeping our food system healthy and safe at the table. We are doing tremendous amounts across our members on that, and we need to continue to lift that up and help others along with that journey. Second, what is the nutritional content? How do we help really continue to invest in those portfolios? How do we make sure that that type of investment is coming through in workplace feeding programs and nutrition programs as well? These member companies have really big chains that they touch, and we can do more with that type of activity as well. And then finally, because we are here to talk about how we enable the success of governments in solving what are really sticky, tough challenges in country, how can we help to lift up those nutritional guidelines and make sure that there's awareness and understanding of how we enable and inspire consumers? Food is what brings us together. Those of us who are fortunate to enjoy it with others know that we can influence and engage and change with that. And we're here to help inspire that together with the business leadership going into the Nutrition for Growth Summit. Thanks so much, Lawrence. Thank you, Diane. I'm doing a PowerPoint later, and I'm, I'm worried about the music now. So <laughs> thank you. That was great. Thank you for the energizer. That was great. So WBCSD is members of mostly larger companies, multinational companies, but we know and we know how critical they are for scale, but we also know that small and medium enterprises are where really the, the bulk of uh, Africans and South Asians and people all over the world get their food uh, from. What are we doing to support those SMEs? They, they may not have scale yet, but they have, they have high relevance for mo the most malnourished. I'm pleasure to introduce Lauren Landis, who is the Director of Nutrition. Sorry if that's not the exact title. Director of Nutrition at the World Food Program. And the World Food Program really deserves a lot of credit because it's the, it's the UN agency that has said, we want to work with the private sector. I mean, pretty much all of them now are saying that. Not all of them, but pretty much all of them. But WFP was saying it five, ten years ago. So Lauren, um, World Food Program and GAIN co-convene for Sun, the Sun Business Networks. And Lauren's going to tell us a bit about how do we take the, S the SBN business network to the next level. Thank you, and good morning. You know, I had all these papers with me because I was afraid that the group this morning not, might not understand the Sun Business uh, Network, and so I had, you know, all these talking points to make sure that everyone in the room understood it, particularly with Gerda in the audience or in, on the panel. But clearly, I don't need to spend any time uh, talking about that because we're among friends. Uh, I think one of the things I should start with and it's already been pointed out this morning that 10 years ago, this would have been a difficult issue to talk about a business platform uh, linked to nutrition. But now that's really not an issue. 10 years ago, we might have found five national platforms out there globally that were really focused on bringing companies together to talk about nutrition. Now, around the world, we already have uh, platforms in 14 Sun countries, and we have, if not 15, another 20 uh, in progress. The demand is clearly there. It's just simply finding the right conveners to bring the groups together. So I think the expectation of GAIN and of the World Food Program is to have about 27 networks uh, around the world in place by the end of 2020. Now that's not 180 nations, but these are in countries that need it the most, I, I would say. So how do we take it to the next level? What is it that we need to do uh, among us and, and globally? And first of all, uh, as has been said so well this morning, it needs to happen at the national level. Not only do we need to increase the number of nations that are creating Sun Business Networks, finding the right conveners, and bringing those SMEs together, but we need to increase the number of SMEs that join each one of those networks. So it's twofold, I would say, at the national level. But I would also say that at the global level, um, it, it 
not only is it country level led, we need that global growth. And, and I, I'm hoping that the energy is still there. I understand that one of the commitments is going from the 650 global companies that are out there already that are part of the Sun Business Network at the global level and the uh, Nutrition for Growth goal is to make that 3,000 by 2024. That would be both the global network and the national network. And I think that's an ambitious goal that needs some energy uh, behind it, but I also believe that it's totally achievable. Um, I think, too, we need to do what Gerda was talking about this morning, is connecting those silos. I think where we're going to get the biggest bang with the Sun Business Network is if we're able to connect that business to business connection, if we're able to connect the global networks with those national networks. And that's where we need to have also uh, a great emphasis. So let me explain how that works. A global network might come together to do advocacy, to promote workforce nutrition. There's a lot of things that they can do to bring, even easy steps that can bring nutrition into um, center focus uh, globally. But when they can provide technical assistance to those national networks to help them do an even better job, and when they can create strong partnerships between global and national networks, then we're really getting something. Then we're really getting the, the momentum going. Two other things that I would suggest is, is really um, that we need to do a better job. How, this is how to take it to the next level. We need to do a better job in creating that investment case for business. Investment case for business at the global level, but really at the national level. How can we help businesses at the national level really understand how they can make a profit but still do the right thing for nutrition? How can they understand how to make a profit and still do the right thing for the beneficiaries that we're all trying to uh, serve, for the companies and for the people who eat their uh, food globally. And the fifth thing I would suggest is that we really spend some time to focus on women-owned businesses. Now, okay, this seems easy, but I think it, it, it's also very uh, challenging. Women particularly in Africa uh, and, and in Asia, they really have a lot to say about what gets bought in the market, who buys it, what they eat, and how it's prepared. But can you imagine if we could even get a stronger focus about women-owned businesses who are working in food processing? Then I think we're really going to have some greater strength. Now, the challenge here is that they're probably going to need a little bit more help. They need linkage to financing systems. And they may, their companies may be smaller and need uh, the greater linkage to TA, whether that's national technical assistance or even global. But I think we have, we stand, if we really want to take it to the next level, I think this is an area we could foc we should really focus on. If I have a moment more, I would just say, um, how do we make it a reality? Who needs to help? And, and I would say it's all of us. It's all the stakeholders, and it's all of us linking together, as we've heard already uh, this morning. Continue the growth at the national level. Connect with, uh, continue the growth at the global level, but connect with governments. We've already heard it this morning, but often governments don't know what to ask for. They don't know where to go, how to put the right policies in place, how to encourage but not get run over. They really need uh, some of our best guidance. And then how to uh, connect with emerging markets, and this is where we really need to work with our business colleagues the most. Um, I was just overwhelmed by the figures on how much of the low and middle come income countries buy in the commercial markets. Somehow you have this traditional view that everyone is growing at least a part of the food that they consume, but really it's, it's not the case. 
For lower income urban consumers, 75 to 90% of their food is purchased as opposed to homegrown, and processed foods represent 50 to 70% of the monetary value of what is purchased. Wow. We really need to focus in this area, and I think we all have a, a part to play. So I guess my recommendations for both GAIN and for WFP is let's not be cautious. We're already out there. Let's keep going. Um, and really try and think outside the box. Maybe we're not linking because we're not part of the private sector. Maybe we're not linking correctly. Maybe we need to really listen more closely to businesses, but also uh, to consumer, consumers. And last point, don't forget that low-hanging fruit. I think there's a lot of ways that we can get in there. Workforce nutrition is a perfect way that a global company, but even an SME, can get in there and start to think about the nutrition of its own employees and then about the population that they serve, either the people that they sell to uh, or the people that government needs uh, is trying most hard, uh, trying to reach, uh, but it may be the most vulnerable and the hardest to reach. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, Lauren um, mentioned uh, SMEs need to, uh, need help to get access to finance. So we're going to hear a bit from Sophia, my colleague Sophia Condes, in a second. Gunild has uh, Gunild and her team have communicated brilliantly on the importance of food. Food can fix it, and they back that up with some serious science. Um, but if we don't, and I'm going to I'm going to come to you later on. But if we don't have the companies that can produce this food and make it available and affordable and desirable, we're not going to get anywhere for, the, for, for those on low and middle incomes. And SMEs are a big part of that. So my colleague Sophia is, is leading some work that we're doing at GAIN um, about how do we get finance to these companies. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming this morning. So. Uh, I was going to start by giving you a lot of statistics about the role of SMEs in the local food system, but I think that's not really necessary. Um, I think most of us here acknowledge that the real food consumed by the real consumer in low-income countries comes from local SMEs. So um, what do these SMEs that are supplying food in low-income countries need to thrive, to grow, to become the big players of a local food industry that is nutritious and sustainable. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the learnings that GAIN has taken on from over a decade working with SMEs, and especially from the last 18 months where we've been building a, an investment facility that will focus on providing investments to small, medium enterprises that are supplying nutritious foods in Africa. So what do these type of companies need? So I think the, the micro, the small companies, for those types of companies, they still need grants. Uh, they need grants to, to start, to, to even survive. But for the middle-sized companies that are, um, the reality is that they're the ones that have the highest potential for growth and for scale, grants are just not enough. That's not gonna cut it. Um, so these companies, what they need is two main things, and that's from really a decade of learning of what companies uh, in this context really need. They need um, appropriate financing, and I'm not just saying financing, because these companies can have access to financing, but the financing that they have access to is incredibly difficult for them to take on. It's just too restrictive. So they need financing that has softer rates than the local market. They need patient capital that has longer tenure. But also, as important as financing is they need the right technical assistance to really build their capacity to increase the efficiency, uh, the productivity, and the quality of the food that they're supplying. So first I'm gonna start telling you a little bit about the roadblocks of what has made it challenging to give them the support they need. And then I'm gonna give you some ideas about the solutions. So in our view, there's three main roadblocks. The first is that there's not enough investment going into the space. So just a question for the audience, out of all the global investments that is happening annually, what percentage do you think 
is going to food and agriculture in low-income countries. 10%? Who thinks 10%? No, 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 no. Less than five. Five? Less than five. Less than one percent? Well, over, overall, in all countries. Low-income countries. So it's actually less than one percent. Considering that this is a sector that employs almost one billion people. Does that sound right? So, <laughs> uh, and of that less than 1%, most of it that is going into low-income countries is actually going into export crops. So, foods like coffee or sugarcane are definitely getting much more attention than nutritious foods like eggs for the local population, right? So, just kind of like an eye-opener why business as usual, as usual is not really working. So, that's the main first challenge. The second challenge is that if we want to move into better financing, that means that we have to work with donors. And this is a new way of working for donors. Donors that are used to providing grants for grant programs. And although there's been a lot of interest and enthusiasm and talk, very few of them are actually dipping their toes in doing blended finance and doing social finance. Because it means a, a new way of working and it, it also means a lot of institutional kind of change. So that's the second challenge. I think the third challenge, and actually the most important, is that there's a huge lack of expertise and lack of information about what do we mean when we say a positive investment for nutrition. Because although we've been hearing a lot about impact investment in the last 10 years, very few impact investors have any expertise in the food system. Close to zero have any expertise in nutrition. So what do we need to change the dynamic? I think first, and this is very important at the local level, we need local governments to really acknowledge that this is an under-invested area and that they need to set the right policies in place to attract investment. But if they are only attracting investment for experts, that's just not going to be good enough for the local nutrition. Second, we need providers of finance, and that, by that I mean local finance providers, development finance institutions, international investors to, bring, to adopt a nutrition lens. But that's where it gets very tricky, right? Because if you're a, I mean, if you work in the financial industry, you don't really know the difference between why a coffee investment might help raise incomes, but it's not gonna have a direct impact on the nutrition of the local population compared to an investment in a local egg company. So you need to give them the tools to be able to make the difference. And those tools are not there yet. Gain is doing some work in that space. And we're hoping that in the next year we will have indicators to share with the rest of the financial industry. But that's a big gap that is still there. Um, so we need to fill in that gap. And we're trying to do um, part of that work. But we need all of you to also realize that that, that gap is there. Um, and then I think also we need donors to get more comfortable with providing catalytic finance. Um, and because the reality is private capital will only come once that catalytic finance is there. And then finally, we need more intermediaries to connect the dots between the financial industry, the entrepreneurs, the SMEs, that, that's the pipeline, and the nutrition community. So I think a lot of us in this room can play that role. So how do we scale up the response? In our view, we need to move from from talking about blended finance for nutrition and better finance for nutrition to doing better finance for nutrition. Um, I want to give one example of an initiative from GAIN that is doing that. It's the Nutritious Foods Financing Facility focused on uh, investing in SMEs that are producing and supplying good food for Africa, local companies. We're starting with four countries, Nigeria, Tanzania, Kenya, Mozambique. This is an investment facility that includes a $50 million impact investing fund. That's a great start. I'm hoping it will be a demonstration effect. But the reality is that if we want to improve the local food system, we need dozens of such facilities. And we need hundreds of businesses to be supported um, and to become successful. And when I, when I think about successful businesses, I love the example of Twiga Foods from Kenya. I mean, it went from grants to catalytic capital to now successfully raising commercial capital from Goldman Sachs. But I'm a little bit tired of hearing that example because it means that it's the only example that I'm hearing. <laughs> so I need hundreds of Twiga foods. Because once we have many examples like that, 
the big banks will come, right? And that's when we shift the needle. We've seen what that can happen with the microfinance industry. We have, we've seen what can happen with the renewable industry. So in my view, that's my vision for scale. I want the same thing to happen for nutrition. Thank you. So Melissa said she didn't like going after David to present, but I don't like going after Sophia now because that was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about something we've been working on uh, at GAIN called the Food System Dashboard. Because information, evidence, data, despite the fact we live in the fake news era where information seemingly doesn't matter anymore, uh, it does matter for lots of decision makers at the national level, for governments, for businesses, for civil society. It's not the only thing that counts. Dialogue is really super important. If it can be linked to data to make decisions all the better. So if you could put my slides up, that would be great. It's um, Jess Fanzo was going to do this. Uh, uh, so if you're thinking it's weird that I'm moderating and presenting, you're right. It is. But this is, a, this is an initiative that um, GAIN, Hopkins, uh, uh, Harvard, and Michigan State have, have developed. We're hoping to launch it at Stockholm. This is just to give you a sneak preview. Um, it is, um, clicker's not working. Can you, can you move it ahead for me? This could be a one slide presentation. <laughs> no? I'll tell you what it's about. I'll tell you why we're doing it. If you look at the information that's available on food systems, it's all over the place. Uh, you have to, un, you know, I'm, I come from a research background, and even for me, it's really hard to find the data. Um, it's all over the place in different databases. It's, some of it's privately held, some of it's publicly held, some of it's publicly held and available, some of it's publicly held and secretive. So, if you want to describe your food system, if you want to diagnose it, which bits are weak in terms of the outcomes you care about, and if you want to actually then take actions based on the data and the diagnosis, you need something to pull it all together. It doesn't look like this is going to happen. No? OK, well, now we'll just talk about it. It's, um, we've pulled together 150. So, so we originally did this for, for gain. It was a very selfish activity. We did it for gain. We wanted our nine country offices to be evidence-driven and data-driven in terms of which crops, where do we focus in the food value chain, which groups, uh, what are the, some of the solutions that we come up with. We started pulling the data together, and we said it's actually just as easy to pull it together for 160 countries as it is for nine countries. So we've pulled it all together. We've um, organized it. There are 150 indicators. We've organized it around six areas, drivers, um, food supply, I'm probably going to miss some of them, food environment, um, individual behavior, um, demand creation, diet outcomes, nutrition outcomes. Those are the roughly the six areas. And uh, it's, it's going to go live in the next couple of months as a, as a platform. The, the data are, are there. They've been quality graded. They're, they're really up to date. There's lots of graphics. There's five types of food uh, typologies in case a country wants to. It's, it's a great, great way of starting a conversation about what does my uh, food system look like and who are my comparators and, and uh, colleagues in, in, in this category of food system. It, um, we, we're now working on, um, so you, you've got these indicators, you've got these trends at the national level when do the warning lights go off? When, does the, when do the amber lights go off and when do, the, when do the red lights go off? And then linking those warning lights to what can you do? Uh, what are some of the options for you to, to act? What are some of the uh, things that have worked well over here that you might want to begin to consider to work over here? So it's not telling anyone what to do. It's giving them options to describe their food system. It's giving them ways of helping them diagnose their food system and it's helping um, decision makers decide on what are the priorities for them to act on. 
Um, it's, it's going live, uh, as I said, as the, in terms of the data, but the, the diagnostics and the decision-making bit, we're still working on that. It's, um, I think it's going to be a fantastic resource for everybody. I know it will be for GAIN. I hope it will be for everybody else. I'm um, presenting it next week in Washington as well to a bigger audience who are going to grill me on the details. Um, I think it's going to be a great resource. It's available soon. Um, I've run out of words to say because it's, uh, it's hard to present a set of slides. I will circulate it. Thank you. I will circulate it. This, oh, so the slide deck, yeah. And it has all the links. We hope eventually this will get picked up by... This is actually a contribution to the Nutrition for Growth. We hope this will get picked up by the UN at some stage. Um, we couldn't convince them to do it, and so we're hoping to... We're doing it ourselves. So, thank you. I think that's... Oh! I, th I think I've just said everything. If you could just click through a few. Oh, it's working. I'll just show you a couple of slides. Um, I just said all that. Um, better decisions is the goal. This is what the homepage is going to look like. Uh, there'll be a compare and analyze for different countries. They'll, and then the most of it is country dashboards, country level dashboards. And uh, these, are the in, these are the indicators in the different areas. So you see there are lots of different areas. Uh, and the real challenge really is to figure out if you're if you're confronted with a mass of indicators, you my your, your initial reaction is to run screaming from the room. So how do you make yeah exactly? Thank you, Vanessa. So how do you make sense of all of that? And that's that's the bit we're currently working on in terms of the diagnostics. We want to come up with some very simple traffic lights, but we've been able to categorize each country into these five types of food systems. Again, a country might say you've got that completely wrong. This isn't us. We're, we're we, we completely disagree with your categorization. But like the, like the GROW document, it's a, it's a consultation. It's a, it's a way of starting a conversation about what your food system actually looks like. Um, the country dashboards have lots of data that are very, obviously, trend data, um, highly relevant. This is just for the food supply stuff. Food environment is down there, and it just keeps going. Um, it's, that's the domain name www.foodsystemdashboard.com. Um, our current, the current partners will add new data as it goes along. We'll refine methods. We want new partners. If any of you would like to become a partner of this initiative, contact me. We'd like that very much, and we hope the UN eventually takes over as a curator. And the steps forward are around um, refining. Uh, we want to go live with the website. Um, and, we're and we're piloting it in three countries to see how we can make it super useful for decision makers in business and in the public. Um, that's it. Describe, diagnose, decide. It's really hard for national policymakers to, s to see their food systems. It's even harder for them to figure out which bits are not working for the environment and for nutrition. And, it's, and, and they need that if they're going to figure out to decide what action to take at the national level. So that's it. Um, thank you for getting that working. Yes. So I think we have about 10 minutes for some discussion, Q&A, and then I'm going to hand over to Vanessa and Christian. Let me be a little uh, provocative, and thanks for uh, this great presentation, Lawrence. Um, you know, I just, um, I'm very encouraged by everything we have discussed this week. It's amazing to see how the system approach is all over. And there are so many exciting things going on, which gives me hope. But at the same time, we are in 2020. This is the last year, the last decade we have to literally turn things around. And what I'm missing, what I'm really concerned about, we haven't talked about where are the commitments. Agnes said yesterday that she wants to make the summit all about commitments. Are we serious about this or are we not? And I think we should now talk about the coalition of the willing, that is actually willing to now make some bold commitments. 2030 is a hard deadline for us, uh, or a milestone at least. And I would like to bring up an example from cities, uh, because we are talking at the national level, but governments, 
they are going to follow. That's my uh, bet. Uh, cities, where the future happens first, they have now, as a result of the uh, collaboration we have with the C40 Cities Network, 14 of 50 cities in an urban food system network have now committed to implement the Eat Lancet targets by 2030. And quite interestingly, uh, the mayor of Copenhagen, um, he, when, it, when uh, this declaration was launched in, uh, in uh, October, he said that we have no idea how to do this. It's incredibly complex. We don't have the metrics. We don't have the methodology. But we know it's the right thing to do. So let's work together, develop the, uh, the metrics, the indicators, and let's move forward with partners. And part of this uh, declaration is to change public procurements. They will change urban policies. And they will develop integrated action plans involving private sector and really change the demand uh, and enable uh, healthy, sustainable uh, food to be available and affordable for their citizens. So I would like to put out a big uh, bold idea, which we all already have briefly talked about, Diane and Peter Bakker and Alison uh, as well. With the networks we have uh, in this room, the convening power of all of you, uh, I think that we can help cities move much faster. We can get more cities to join. Um, and we have more than enough knowledge to act. And there is lots of work now going on with the Earth Commission, the Global Commons, the Science-Based Targets Network, developing the Earth System Science Targets. Uh, and obviously, we have the Eat Lancet framework. It's absolutely not perfect, but it's more than enough to start working on science-based targets. Climate, nature, livelihood, and health. And I think we could bring a coalition together of companies that are serious about this, that are willing to commit and saying that we will do this journey together. By 2030, we will uh, set targets and we will make plans to get there. And that could be a contribution towards the, the Nutrition Summit, and it could be something to uh, announce in 2021. So I think uh, it's something we should explore further. And then a final uh, point about uh, the investment and to get governments to act. Uh, FOLU and, uh, and Potsdam Institute and EAT have now soft launched here in Davos the Food Economics Commission to build on the FOLU report to really internalize the costs of inaction versus action of the current food system and look into the political economy. What are the obstacles for change? What is hindering and preventing this transition to happen? And that is not only a global framework, but also something that will be breaking down on the country level. And once governments see what inaction is costing them, that might be a very good incentive for them to break down silos across ministries and really start making integrated action plans. And I think for investors as well, very exciting to hear what is going on. And I think the dashboard is a big contribution. So I think we should now call for more commitments and help Agnes and the UN and really get some firm, bold commitments. We know where we have to go. Thanks. Thanks, Gunil. So I was at a meeting at uh, FAO in October, and they had invited all the networks, all the city networks, together. So C40, MUF, BP, and a bunch of others. And I said to them, do you know there's this nutrition summit coming up in a year and a bit? And none of them knew anything about the nutrition summit. So we now pulled them in, uh, C40 and, and the Milan Pact, into that commitment development process. So I'm, I'd be very happy if you could help us make that happen. Yeah, that, that's great. And rest assured, there are some pretty serious commitments being developed for Japan. I just didn't want to um, tell you all about them. <laughs> One billion, well, for nutrition, well, they're not, I can't share too much because they're still being developed. But the goal in the area that Sophia is, is working in is to have a um, billion dollars of uh, new financing for nutritious foods by the kinds of mechanisms that Sophia is, is undertaking. So that's one of the 10 commitment areas that's being developed. Uh, the workforce uh, commitment areas are, we've just uh, launched a new alliance with the Consumer Goods Forum Workforce Alliance that we're looking for members to have, um, you know, 100 companies with serious workforce uh, c programs, not just in the headquarters, but in their value chains as well. So these commitments are being developed, but 
they're, they're, so, they're too early. In, in three or four months, we can talk a lot more about them. Just a quick question would be to ask how we're thinking about linking the Food Economics Commission with this dashboard. Um, because if you layer on that economics piece, it's really going to drive home not only the data around what's going wrong, what the opportunities are from kind of the health and nutrition standpoint, but again, that very critical, yeah, economics link. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a really nice open source platform. It's, we want it to be as, as uh, inclusive as possible. So if you'd like to add stuff to it, please let us know. Okay, it's me, um, myself and Jess, Fanza. question it's a uh, another question was um, what's the what's the hesitation towards catalytic finance or blended finance um, from a donation level yeah I think she mentioned it so uh, I mean the hesitation is that it requires a lot of donors that are used to giving grants yeah. to now be comfortable giving things such as soft loans, such as first loss type of capital, et cetera. But I think a lot of donors are already doing that, but for other themes that are more established, like, I mean, climate financing has been going on for years, microfinance, et cetera. So I think it's just about making of nutrition and an investment theme, and then making donors more comfortable with it, some of their donor portfolio, even if it's a small percentage, to go into those types of in instruments that are not the traditional grants, pure grants type of uh, donor commitments. Yeah. There's also a political economy issue. The donors don't want to be seen feathering the nests of companies. That's, that's the narrative they want to really avoid okay. as well. Maybe Christian could talk a little bit about that uh, when you make your comments, Christian. Anyone else got any comments, questions? Yeah. Um, in the run-up to the Nutrition for Growth in 2013, the London Olympic Hunger Summit was a useful staging point, and I, I, no one's talked about the Tokyo Olympics. Um, and I was just wondering, for any of the speakers, what kind of an opportunity they see that as, and if so, what they plan to do. There is going to be uh, an event. We don't quite know. If we had someone from Gates or DFID or the Government of Japan, they could tell us a bit more about it, but it's, it's quite... Um, it's hard to get information about, but there will be a, a, a stepping stone in, around the Olympics towards yeah. it. So in your best case scenario for you, what would that look like? Well, you, you just don't know because they're not organized yet. Yeah. And my, sorry, say that again? Best case scenario, a step Yeah, sorry. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a consultant to the Gates Foundation, so therefore this is one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, and I helped organize the, the London ones. Um, but, you know, g everything we've been talking about today is super interesting, but to that previous question of... Uh, the, the lady from EAT, it does need some governments to start stepping up and showing that leadership sort of in the run-up to in order to land in December where you're trying, trying to get to. Gerda, at the Nepal meetings, there were quite a few governments that stepped up. Do you want to just tell us a bit about that? Well, it's still sorted out, and it's sorted out uh, t uh, between uh, the Japanese government and the Gates Foundation, so um, I would have expected that you could tell us something. But um, my suggestion also to Chris Elias would be that um, uh, Pri Prime Minister Abe is in this do step, uh, doorstep uh, event during the Olympics and invites uh, leaders that are champions in nutrition, drivers in uh, at for change, uh, uh, and are really performing well uh, in order to be accountable for what they promise to do from each of the regions, and then also pick leaders of um, uh, companies, of business, uh, who can drive uh, change. Um, maybe some institutions or some movements like uh, like Agra, it, it's obvious that, that, that Agnes should be there. Um, uh, but also NGOs and, and, and other uh, players in society. But it will be only a limited uh, group, but they need to be the drivers for the best possible uh, ambitious but realistic and measurable uh, um, commitments in uh, December. And Japan and Gates and DFID will be trailing some of their commitments, I understand, yeah. and they will be showcasing some governments who are willing to step up and some, bi some businesses as well. 
And I'm going to ask Vanessa to give us some, ask Vanessa to give us some reflections. This ends in 10 minutes, right? Yeah. So what can we do in 10 minutes to change the world? And I only have five of the 10. And um, uh, I have a question. When's the last time any of you were in a rural African village? Recently? Yeah. yeah. So um, I used to sit around in uh, tiny villages outside of Kuchiala with the women paying back loans, microfinance loans of $50 that they paid back over six to nine months. And we'd sit around counting money and telling stories about their families, about their children, about the children who died, about f hunger season, who was growing what, what they expected. Uh, after, you know, hours and hours of this, it almost feels inevitable and normal to have this conversation. They're still laughing, they're singing, counting money, paying back their loans, and, 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 and a friend of mine came out with me and said, but they're happy, you know? People, th with all of this burden and all of this weight and this trauma, which is just unimaginable, they're living their lives and doing absolutely amazingly the best that they can in spite of the environment, the lack of rain, horrible sandstorms, you name it. And, and this experience never leaves you, right? It just doesn't go away. And so I feel like I grew up with amazing opportunities and privilege, as many of you did, and it's personal. To me, it, this is, is very personal. How, how am I, and how are my teams, and how are your teams demonstrating this change that we think is the new norm? How can we drive investments in really tiny companies? How can we change procurement procedures? How can we get our staffs to not sit down all day and eat too much food? Um, I think it's so complicated. Behavior change is just incredibly complicated. Organizational change is complicated. You're talking about WFP, you know, the procurement processes that we, DSM, WFP, are trying to get from farmers, right? So that it's not like a call for proposals and disruptions in markets and not knowing whether you're gonna actually grow something that somebody's gonna buy and heaven forbid knowing that it's killing you with aflatoxin levels that are through the roof. Not to mention, you know, uh, the fact that uh, in Ethiopia, where I spent a number of years, the, the malnutrition stunting rates are incredibly high despite huge investments in the nutrition information. And, and, and it's cultural, right? Dietary, <laughs> cultural, right? You're coming to Ethiopia. I'm nailing you on this one. So the, the question is, um, I think, and I've just been reading all of your websites as you're all talking, and, and I love this data set that you're making available because as many of you know at Agra, we're working with governments to actually look at their capacity to translate their policies into action in the field, right? A lot of them do have policies on paper. Okay, some are outdated or whatever, but it's that translation of the policy into action, into implementation that is incredibly challenging. And if I come back to these governments, they're dependent 50% or more on development financing and funding, right? So we're, they're not even making the decisions they want to make about where their resources go necessarily. They have to abide by, as you know, the World Bank procedures and you know, 101 different uh, requirements and political economies of all of our governments. So it's extremely challenging. And, and I spent a year in a ministry in Mali <laughs> in the chief of staff's office watching people come in and out and telling you what you have to write a file for and I write a file for the next guy who's gonna come and give us money, and I write another file for the next guy who's gonna come and give us money. So we get bits and scraps of money to do a tiny bit of what we wanna do in that government. You've been there, you know what I'm talking about, but how do we actually, and I, I agree with Gerda, right? It's not moving fast enough, 
it's not aligned enough. The Ministry of Health is scraping together a little money here. The Ministry of Ag is scraping together a little money there. We're talking about smart subsidies. We're talking about tiny uh, businesses, right? I mean, we're just at Agra, we're only working with about 6,000 agro dealers and SMEs and food processors in the, in the uh, 12 countries that we're in. My estimate is that we should be working with nearly a million just in Africa. So how do we get from 6,000 to a million? And how, what, I mean, it, there's financing, but there's also this fantastic question of food safety. Who said food safety? Uh, it's an incredibly important issue, right? Um, because the worst thing is actually, I mean, you guys know what, what you see on the outside of the package is not what's inside the package. I mean, I'm focused on Africa, but I spent a while in Vietnam as well. What I loved in Vietnam is this growing sense of um, the, the linkage between the cities, as you were saying, the cities and the source of food and the lack of confidence of their own consumers in their own food sources. And I love that because it's actually bringing it home. So they're starting to actually take people from cities back to villages to say, this is where your food is coming from. So, you know, right? Build that confidence back up. So this is just uh, my way of saying that, yes, I think that um, phenomenal agenda in terms of global opportunity for raising awareness and visibility. And um, each of you is working day and night like crazy people, right? <laughs> not sleeping, trying to move this agenda forward. Um, but it's complicated. And so to, if we can take Lawrence's brilliant dashboard and, and make it real time, if we can get some financial analytics into that, if we can get these micro companies and mega companies linked up and the procurements aligned, you know, I, I do think that, that that will have a cumulative impact. Um, but it's, it's an incredibly very, very challenging struggle. Every day, I am a diehard optimist. But because my Malian family still calls me and rambles in Bambara, and I'm like, oh my god, how do I say this? Yes, I love you. Yes, you're going to be okay. And um, I'm so happy your four kids uh, finally got through school. Um, you know, I hope that their lives are going to be better. Nala sona, detam namasiganalim. Thank you, Vanessa. Before you close, I'm not closing. Okay. There's another person to speak. Can I, can I say uh, a little thing? Because, Vanessa, when you took the floor, I was singing, Vanessa, give us hope, Vanessa, give us hope. But you came forward with so many question marks. I think the brilliancy of the many meetings during this WEF is showing us that we don't uh, continue to think that with global new initiatives, we can improve the world we are uh, getting reality that it has to happen at country level and that we need to navigate, work together, push the government, build capacity, leave our logos and egos uh, at the door. And my takeaway of this WEF is we are gonna prove that we can move the needle at country level. And we are able to set aside with all we have and all the important things that are here, but we are going to prove that we can make a difference. We understand it's difficult, but here is our ambition and here is our commitment. And this is what I take from uh, this WEF um, uh, and that we can bring, uh, bring further. So I'm extremely hopeful uh, and I see the complexities, but the drive here is amazing. Oh, you have already in the micro. Thanks, Gerda. This was about what I was going to say, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I completely agree. Um, well, yes, a lot of questions, but, but yes, we have a huge opportunity now to make this work. And uh, I think uh, we, have all the, we have all the pieces. There's not so much uh, reinvention uh, needed. Um, we talked about this sort of global, national, local, uh, extremely important uh, uh, levels. Uh, Gunhild rightly pointed out cities. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, an area we're working uh, in strongly also uh, as the Swiss Development Agency because cities are, they have food systems of their own. 
and they're really uh, the interface between raw production, local uh, transformation, consumption, and then uh, there is also the whole question of where, you know, where do the nutrients go? Uh, how do you, how do you manage waste in in, in cities, uh, and how could that waste maybe be used differently, uh, um, you know, in the in the local uh, uh, food system? Um, need for dialogue, need for uh, working together, absolutely, uh, completely, completely agree. We've heard uh, from the private sector, um, better products, safe of course, nutritious, healthy, affordable, sustainable. Um, what we haven't heard yet is marketed in a responsible way, because that is uh, critical as well, it's part of it. Um, and you know, creating the right type of demand is is is, is, is really important there. Um, a group we have not seen, which maybe we should we should see more in this type of dialogue, are consumers, because at the end of the day, um, you know, we all of us we are actually uh, consuming the products, and uh, consumer organisations really have a, a critical role uh, to play. Um, the investment case, yes. It is difficult. It is difficult uh, to create that case for uh, small and medium enterprises um, at the local level. Why uh, is there not sufficient investment? Well, it's because it's very high risk. It's very high risk. The returns uh, are, are, not, are not guaranteed. Um, development, development agencies are not necessarily set up to actually invest. Often, uh, these responsibilities are in different ministries. Development cooperation organizations are set up to make grants, and uh, you know the capacity uh, to uh, make return-based investments uh, is elsewhere. So something which uh, which absolutely uh, needs to be uh, discussed. Important also, this type of finance has to be outcome and impact-based finance. So we uh, talk about social impact uh, incentives, and and we work on that with uh, small companies on the ground. So what is critical is that these high impact enterprises uh, have then clear outcomes uh, to be uh, financed, which actually uh, make a difference. So we have a few interesting timelines and deadlines coming up. So yes, we will go uh, to the, uh, the Nutrition for Growth uh, Summit uh, at uh, the end of the year. Uh, before that, we have actually the, the CFS 47, uh, that will uh, look at the voluntary guidelines on, on, on food systems and hopefully they will be approved. That's the more an important stepping stone. The COP, next important stepping stone, Nutrition for Growth Summit, and then the Food Systems Summit in 2021. Important timelines which will sort of help all of us, hold all of us to actually accountable for moving forward. So we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, we should use this as uh, stepping stones. Commitments, commitments are important, um, but I think the, uh, the Nutrition for Growth Summit should not just become another pledging conference where huge amounts are pledged. And well, then let's see what happens until the next conference. So whatever, <laughs> I urge all of us, if we make commitments, let's make them real. Let's, and let's put them into practice with clear deliverables and uh, clear accountability. Governance, Gerda, you said it, the system, uh, and you and Esther described it very impressively, is somewhat chaotic, um, is not very well organized. We start moving into uh, the right direction, uh, but yes, that will need governance, and this is something we need to uh, discuss uh, seriously. And to end, well, you know, it's all about people, yeah. right? Let's not forget, when we talk about nutrition, health, food systems, let's not forget that it's people. People are at the heart of it. And if we don't get the social element right, the whole thing will not work. Yeah. So with that, back to Lawrence. <laughs> no more words from me. That was a great ending of this session. Thank you so much for coming. I, I would say, I will say two things. First of all, <laughs> these, sorry, I can't resist. These, these sessions are, you know, we most, we, most of us know each other in this room. So it's important to inspire each other and to, and to do this sort of bonding social capital. But it's much more important for us to go out and inspire people who never even thought about these issues before. That's the bridging stuff that we all have to do. And if we do it well, 
We will, if we do it well, at the corner of my eye, I see this threatening presence. Uh, if we do it well, we will, we will rock, we will rock the summit. Is this just to get me to shut up? We will rock the summits. We will rock the summit. So two things. Look, I just, Gerda said we must move the needle. Can I just say, the needle is moving. Just remember this. The needle is moving. Martin is here. Look at what's been achieved there. Look at what Diane talked about. Look at what Gerda has managed to do. Look at what everybody here has managed to do through giving power to others. But the point is, we can help the move, needle move to where it needs to go. The rich, the rich can be well nourished because they can afford it. The issue is poor people. Poor people in poor countries, poor people in rich countries. What are summits for? They're not the end, they're a means to the end. It is a chaotic system, but goodness me, our community has done an extraordinary thing over the last 10 years. But the reason why we're feeling like we are is because fundamentally at heart, we're quite humble people. We know we're not gonna solve it. We know that others solve it. We're just there to help. So really, feel bloody good. Oh. Feel good. Maurizio, feel good. <laughs>